What is up, everybody? Welcome to The Stack. I'm Alex. I'm Justin. I'm Pete. And on The Stack, we talk about a bunch of books that have come out this week. Let's Comic kick it books. off. Comic books. We're talking Com- comic books, guys. Oh, oh right. Oh, oh, no. I read uh, a bunch of novels. Uh, oh, geez. I thought we were talking Moby Dick and Huckleberry Finn and <laughs> your classic novels. <laughs> Our take on Moby Dick is going to be defining for this story. Well, listen, call me Ishmael. Why don't we move to some potentially new classic novels, which is what I like to call comic books. Starting Ooh. with Ghost Machine, number one from Image Comics, written by Jeff Johns, Peter J. Tomasi, Lamont McGee, and Maital Zachut. Art by Gary Frank, Brian Hitch, Jason mm-hmm. Babook, Francis Matapool, yeah. Peter Steenberg, and Ivan Rice. Wow. So the big deal with this book is that it is previewing what they're calling a new co-op. It's a writer-artist co-op. It is them looking at the Image Comics model and trying to take it one step further. They all own equally in this company, in this imprint, and their goal is to launch four distinct new comic book universes. We've already seen a bunch of one of them, which is Jeff Johns and Gary Frank's The Unnamed Universe that has Geiger and Junkyard Joe and Redcoat and a couple of other titles that we've gotten hints of here and there. But here, for the first time, we're seeing a bunch of other titles from these other new creators that are coming out. So it's a little bit of a sampler packet. Mm -hmm. And later on in the year, I believe beginning of April... They're going to be launching three or four titles, and then the goal is to keep launching more and more titles throughout the year and to come. So that's the background on this issue. Obviously, we have a lot of great creators here, so it definitely feels like they're putting a lot of hype on this issue. Do you think it panned out in the actual issue itself? I mean, I love a a package like this where you get to see stories from across these different uh, universes and very different worlds to dip into. The little like uh, player stack cards, like the back of a a Marvel Masterworks uh, card where you see like what the deal is with all of these characters. Like, I love all of that. And and a lot of the stuff does seem cool. I really liked the um, the family line, the Rocket Fellers, I thought was really fun. And uh, Hornsby and Halo, I, I guess Peter J. Tomasi, I, I just like him as a writer. So that was really cool. The the Jeff John stuff, I, I just feel like we've seen the same Geiger story like truly five times. And like, I know we read more comics and this is meant to be like, hey, first time seeing this, check this out. So like, that's dope for that. I'm just like, Geiger has to move on. He has to walk away from some of his stuff, get away from this place where his family died. But the red coat story, I'm curious about it. Uh, that is interesting to me for this, like sort of to give you the backstory on it. Red coat is an immortal red coat soldier who's like a dick and he messes up a bunch of stuff in history, I guess. So that seems like a fun story as well. Yeah, I liked the the Rook stuff. That was really kind of cool and interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I don't get uh, tired of uh, Gary Frank's uh, art. So if I, if they want to keep throwing Geiger at me, I'll keep it and eating it up. I don't care. I I think it's a really badass character. Tasty, Very cool looking. Mm-hmm. So yum yum radiation. Yeah, exactly. Uh, get used to it. You know what I mean? If we're going to survive this post-apocalyptic <laughs> world, man, you've got to be able to eat radiation like a Pac-Man. Uh, so, yeah, I just think that um, this is a fun package. There's a lot of great ideas, really well executed with uh, amazing artists on here. Great so, art. Yeah, I, I think this is a win, uh, a win situation. I'm going to disagree with you a little bit and i'm going to disagree with you in an unfair way because i think this is based on how much they're hyping this up and how much they're like this is the next big thing here we go this is all fine comic book stories with like you said creators that i like i like the writers i like the artists i'm happy to check out the full issues but other positive other than what was it oh the hornsby one uh, horns and Hornsby or Halo and Hornsby uh, Hornsby and Halo Hornsby and Halo uh, that was the one to me that's felt clearest as a story when I read it to this issue and mm. that's about two kids 
who seem to have burgeoning powers, though they don't know why. It's very clearly implied or explained by the back matter that's included here that one of them is an angel and one of them is a demon. They don't really know that. And they're going to grow up with that living behind them. We'll do that. But they've been they switched, will... family switched. Yes. They've been family switched. So the old wife swap situation. But with kids. But with kids, which don't frame it that way. The Now, Pete, let me just real quick. You said the old wife swap situation. It makes it yeah. sound like you've been involved in a wife swap as perhaps as a well, child. He was uh, on the uh, hit television show, Wife Swap. Yeah, I worked he, on it. And, he and did it work on me. Wife Swap. It was, uh, yeah, it was the last thing that I ever worked on. It broke me. Yeah. The last thing you've ever worked on? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you retired after that. You retired? Really liked wow. Hornsby and Halo. I thought and that was television. a very clear concept and a good story. Yeah. The rest of these were like, I don't know how best to describe them. They were like aperitifs. It was, yeah, hey, were are you interested previews. in Geiger? What do you think? We're not going to give you much here, but there you go. This is what this looks like. Same thing with Redcoat. I want... I want this to be more a shot across the bow. I want to feel those oh shit moments and an excitement of reading these titles. We will, to be clear, as a comic book review show, probably read every single one of these first issues for sure and review them and talk about them. So that's not a question in my mind, but I am not yeah. sold on so this as the next big thing. In why comics. are you angry, man? They I'm gave not us just... sold on this as the next big thing in comics after reading this issue. This feels like more comics. You're saying from a storytelling point of view. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Well, but I think I think their selling point is the stories are what they're doing. But I think this was more of a selling point of like, look who we have here. We have these mm -hmm. writers, these artists. You know all these names. You like these names. And then it was like, this is a new type of storytelling or a new type of comic book company in that everyone is in in on the profit sharing from the for any iteration of any of these uh, IP properties or whatever. So it's like, I think they're 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 establishing the sort of collective, I think, with this and giving you a little sample. It's like mm -hmm. when you're at a wedding and you know, you see the trays going around. Yeah, you, know, you, you can't get like a little bit. You want you can't a put steak, an arm but... load. You can't put an arm load of the mushroom toast in your <laughs> yeah, exactly. on your plate, Alex. You can't do that. You get one toast, stuffed mushrooms, and then yeah. maybe like, you can. I like mushroom toast, and I want to have a better sense of what a mushroom toast is by having a full size toast. Well, you can't. Well, maybe go to dinner, but I'm sorry, you're at a wedding. You're not yeah. at a sit down dinner. You Alex. can't you're get mad at a wedding about yeah. just having samples. Yeah, I guess that's the thing. I'm at the reception, but I want to be at the main meal. I want yeah, chicken exactly. or fish or steak, and that's it. And you want to sit down. I you mean, sit you're down. trying to go to a wedding because you want the chicken? <laughs> Alex, Why else would you go to a wedding? Oh, wow. for the chicken you're, you're a wedding crasher for not the party, just for the food. I'm very hungry. I mean, that's a great that's a great sequel to what I got to feed my ghost it's, machine. You know what I'm talking about? That's well, all that yeah, like, stupidness mean. aside. I think what's nice about this is you're getting a, a real sample of different options that are coming out. It's a cool preview where it's not just kind of you're really getting a little bit of a look see about what these comics will look like and feel like. And I think that's a cool this thing. This is the sort of thing. Sorry, this is, and again, I understand the way that I'm looking at it is not fair, but just to, I have to express my feelings. That's very important. If this yes. was lying next to the register and they were like, hey, we got these free copies of Ghost Machine number one. You want to check out a sampler of their new upcoming stuff? I'd be like, oh, cool. Oh, this is fun. But as something that's like, here we go. This is a comic we are selling in comic book shops. Mm. I don't know. A little too are much. You saying you want this for free? I, I, I don't understand what your problem is. <laughs> Here is somebody who's trying to create something for the people, by the people, where it's like, hey, this is a collective. No more of, like, artists losing rights and getting mm -hmm. left out to dry. We're going to try to work together and create something. Here's what I want. I, what like, I want ah, is I happen to be in my suit this, and I pass by. Up. I pass by and there's a wedding and I'm just, I'm walking with the party and I go in and there's a bunch of like appetizers. I'm like, this is great. I'm full on mushroom toasts. I gotta you leave. should be supporting Versus, this. this is a destination wedding. And I'm like, I have already paid to go to Hawaii. You got to fill huh. me up with chicken or fish or steak. <laughs> one of the three. Really? Putting chicken first is crazy. You just keep saying chicken first. Like you're going to the wedding and over dying for the chicken. Are you ordering the steak? It's always like, Probably. it's just a medallion. That's all they're doing. Oh, oh 
Um, okay, what are you uh, trying to get fish, Connie? You trying to get a sa- <laughs> uh, overcooked fish. salmon? I'm not going to eat fish at a wedding. Gross. What's so good about the chicken? It's That's got like broccoli. The steak, the steak is always like, mm, it's not good steak. What are you talking about? The fish, you're not going to eat fish at a wedding because then you're going to smell like fish the entire night, so you get the chicken. Did you want to talk about comics at all, or are you going to keep... What are you going to get the wedding, Pete? We've broken this down. Clearly, Justin's getting the steak. I'm getting the chicken. Steak. Yeah. Chicken, fish, or steak. It depends Pete's... on where it is. Pete's where is the... the wedding? If we're by water, I'm going to get the fish. If no. we're in a kind of place that's it's got definitely great... an inland wedding, it's an inland wedding. It's an inland wedding. wedding. Pete's in the back. Pete's in the back in the alley behind the kitchen, hanging out with the staff. If you know what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, I am. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. All right, why don't we move on to the resurrection of Magneto number one from Marvel, written by Al Ewing, art by Luciana Vecchio. This is as part of the Fall of the House of X storyline, but very much side to it for now back uh, two years ago i think i want to say in the trial of magneto magneto died at the end of that storm has a dream in this issue that magneto is important to what's going on with orcus and the greater story with the dominions and every all of these other things and so she goes Mm. after him to the afterlife to try to bring him back i gotta say i was not looking forward to this just because x-men red has been very dense i honestly in all full disclosure did not read the trial of magneto or anything like that um this is a very high hill to climb but there is so much richness in the tapestry of the story in every single page through the art you could feel the weight of storm this powerful character traveling through her history and mild spoilers but basically doing a whole orpheus thing going to hell yeah you get magneto back there is such a weight to everything that goes on it feels mythological and i was completely won over by the end of the issue yes finally you're saying something positive yeah this kicks ass on a number of levels and the the art uh is really awesome and moody the kind of uh different kind of worlds that she's got to jump through also there's this really cool splash page where you see all the different storms lined up man i loved it it was really very very cool and such a great well-executed idea and uh, yeah it was you know it was nice to see storm happy for a little bit in the beginning and then she's like oh now i'm dreaming about magneto it's gonna ruin my fucking life so you know uh i'm worried about what's ahead but man i'm excited for it yeah, I really like the imagery at the top there, Magneto and the dream. I just have a, I have a question, um, and maybe I've missed this, but uh, who's Craig? Because <laughs> Storm wakes up, Storm wakes up in bed with a guy, and and she's like, it's Craig. Oh, she's like Craig, and he's like, Yeah, what, it's she me. She can't date a Craig. Like, what? No, date a Craig. And then What's the only comment, nothing wrong. The only comment we get is Craig isn't a superhero or a mutant or a king. Yeah, and then, it's just Craig. Yeah, I, I guess Craig. I'm just curious about Craig. <laughs> Who is Craig? I also He's probably a really nice guy. You know? He seems I'm nice, sure. very he seems supportive. Great. They we seem only to have see some him sort of like Martian family, so that's nice too. And, yes, they do, which is is great. But we we don't see a lot of Craig after the one scene. Where's yeah. Craig? <laughs> I don't know. Hashtag where's Craig? Uh, why are you worried about Craig so much, man? No, that definitely He's... threw me, too. I, I haven't yeah. been what? reading X-Men Red very religiously, and there's already a yeah. lot of characters in that book. So I assume Craig is why in there. Why can't you but... just date a Craig? Why you guys got to have like, there a There was – it was just a random thing in the beginning because you expect yeah. Storm to be like – I'm with Black Panther. I'm with some other character. I'm dating the wind or something. (laughs) Instead, she's like, I met, she lives on Mars, uh, Rocco. (laughs) And she met a guy who's just Craig. She spends the rest of the issue battling her way through the mutant afterlife to get Rip Magneto's soul out of hell. Love is love, man. She's Craig. She fell in love with a Craig. It doesn't have to be. I'm not saying that she shouldn't be in love with Craig. I Haven't said, where did she Maine meet? Here's what I want to see happen. Just this Wait, is pure speculation, on. but I think we're going to get a scene where they're going to be the final battle with the X-Men and Orcus, and Craig's going to come in and be like, yo, what's the deal? Yeah, he's going to be like, would you guys try flipping this switch off? Turns it off. <laughs> Done. The oh, Dominion gotta, shut down. Unplug. She's like, that's exactly Dominion. why I'm dating Craig. The Dominion? you got to exactly unplug why. it and then plug it back in again, and then I'll, that'll reset. I like... 
I like how Pete's mad at our take, and he's like, haven't you seen Made in Manhattan? Is his <laughs> reference point. It doesn't matter if people are in different statuses of life. I, it's no, not even about status. It no, I, I don't, I don't no, care about Craig's status. Great. Where did she meet Craig, whose defining <laughs> qualities are not a superhero, not a mutant, not a king? Maybe she, you know, met him at a, a, a space roller rink, you know, mm -hmm. maybe a bar. Who cares? That, All you need I, to know is Craig's important to her. I, of course, I'm not shitting on the relationship. I just think it's very funny to I have... bet there's a Martian mutant whose power is Tinder. Like, you go up to them and they can just swipe themselves until yeah. you find your perfect match. You're, hey, Aurora, queen of the storm, you got a Craig coming your way. <laughs> <laughs> uh Anyway, just the only other thing I have to say about this is I agree. This is this is cool. This is fun. I think we have been overloaded with with continuity and just information. So I'm craving light, like just clarity in all X Men stories. And I don't think we need when we got to uh, the guy who she first meets uh, in the Come afterlife. Up, nope. Um, this is Tarn the Uncaring. I was like, I don't want to know about that. I, wanted, <laughs> I was like, I wanted to be just a regular dog man or something. Yeah. I didn't want to see Tarn the Uncaring's backstory. So I'm just saying I have a little bit of information fatigue in my X-Men stories. Let's just have the – because when we got to the stuff later, when she's meeting the Dominion – and or do you think the Dominion is related to the Minions? Because that's a, that's a uh, great did, crossover. It, there was that panel where the Dominion asked for da-da-da. I, I, I could have scripted those words. Why would you <laughs> tee him up for me? Why would you tee him up for Last it. thing to throw out at you, badass yeah. last panel. Like yes. that full-page yeah. splash at the end by Luciano Vecchio was so cool. Like that is – Great art. I want to take that, put that on my wall. Absolutely gorgeous. Um, but – just to throw out a theory to you, do you feel like a lot of this issue is taken up with, we got to get Magneto back for some reason. It seems like you would want the master of magnetism to fight against machine gods, right? So it yes. feels like he's going to be a key figure in the end battle here. I do think so. But the Dominion was sort of like, Magneto, he ain't yeah. shit. And I was like, <laughs> wow, Dominion, he could control your whole thing. Yeah. I think what are you, you made out of plastic are, in space? I think you guys are really getting a little too caught up in I, I, I'm hoping for a Craig love story by the by this whole kind of event. You know what I mean? Craig and Magneto. Craig Nito. I hope when no, they I'm reboot X Men, Craig it's all story. about Craig. Like bring Craig to the <laughs> forefront. Just yeah. make it like what's his day like? Yeah, yeah X Men from the Ashes, Craig. <laughs> <laughs> this is what we're hoping for. Amazon's Attack, number four from DC Comics, written by Josie Campbell, art by Vasco Georgiev. We have a bunch of different characters from the Wonder Woman side of the universe who are not attacking, but in fact under attack by various forces. They're trying to figure out exactly what's happening to them. This is, to borrow a phrase from Justin, I would say a very middle issue, a mid issue, mm. if you will. Oh, wow. Um, no, no, I still, I really liked it where we got a big revelation in the last issue about the villain we thought was behind this is not behind it. We do not find out who it is by the end of the issue. But we do move the characters forward in different ways. But great characterizations from Josie Campbell in here. The relationship between Cassie and Mary Marvel in particular is so fun. There's a yeah. great running bit that I'm oh, yeah, the entrance. The what? The entrance, entrance. stuff. The secret yeah. entrance. The secret so entrance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very funny. So funny. This book is just a blast to read. I'm having such a good time. I agree. And the way that, that, uh, that Josie Campbell has sort of like put just the right amount of character on each of the main players here, I think is awesome. I haven't seen Cassie be so like purely fun in this way and just the right energy to bring to a book where they're under assault, basically like one character who can bring a little bit of energy to it. Great. And this issue was just a great Yara issue. I love Yara. I, I think her in an ensemble book is really nice. And like, I want to see her pop here and then get a book of her own to go do her own thing. Yeah, this has such a great, fun tone to it. I love all the fight sequences. I love just the the humor, the fun that just jumps off this uh, the pages here. It's it's this is really just a blast and a total package. Universal Monsters Dracula number four from Image Comics, written by James Tynion the fourth, art by Martin Simmons. This is the final issue of this mini series, which. 
I gotta, I don't know if there's a retraction or whatever, but when they announced the next miniseries, which is Ram V and Dan Waters doing Universal Monsters Creature from the Black Lagoon, they said, great news. This is like a sequel to the classic Black Lagoon, Creature from the Black Lagoon movie versus Universal Monsters Dracula, which is James Tatton IV and Martin Simmons adapting the original Dracula movie, which was mm. not clear to me at any point. Yeah. And we have at, you know said several times on the podcast, why aren't they taking more chances here? Why are they doing a straight adaptation? Apparently, that's what they were doing. And that they, was the assignment. Uh, the end. Yeah. And I, that is that explains a lot, I think, because mm -hmm. this whole series has been just odd in what it's covering. It's been so much of Renfield and him being like, free me. I love my prison, my blood prison. Free me from this blood prison. And so it's it, this is a Renfield story where Dracula is just this mythic sort of creature haunting just at the edge of the frame beautiful art uh i like the elements here but from a, just a narrative uh take it never really came together for me Ooh. from the jump of this whole whole arc so i i'm i just have never quite understood what we've covered here all right well i i felt like I agree with what Justin is saying a little bit in that. In the beginning, when we started reading this, I was like, what is happening here? What are we doing? But I feel like this last issue landed the ship in a way where I was like, oh, okay. Now I, now I feel better about it. Where I thought this last issue... The, the start was great, and they they kind of – it got sweet. It was kind of like, oh, that's a nice ending sweet. for this. So I, I, I was happy that at least it landed on this and felt a little bit more original and kind of fun, and I understood why we went on this journey by the end of it. So I feel like a good ending can save a series, and it did here. Mm. I'll, I'll disagree again a little bit here. Love this team. James Tide on the fourth, yeah. absolutely killing it across the board. Martin Simmons, incredible art. As yes. I said with previous issues, I think the real reason for the series was Martin Simmons' art, which is stunning and gorgeous. There's beautiful panels of Dracula in here looking absolutely terrifying. Everything with Renfield and the coloring, where it's just he's oh this wash God. of white, I think yeah. is great as well. But in terms of the pacing, like you were saying, Justin, but to be clear, I'm not totally familiar with the original Dracula movie, so maybe it's like this, but it felt like three issues of not much happening, and here everything happened to this issue, right. and then it wrapped up very quickly. So it sped up a little too much for me here to enjoy it. But to your point, Pete, I like where it ended. I thought that was uh, poignant. Renfield, a good character. I almost wish they had focused exclusively on him for four issues because that was the standout. Mm. I feel like that's what they almost did. Yeah. Almost, but not quite. Next up, <laughs> everybody's most high, highly anticipated issue of the week, all three of us equally. Nope, this is your pick. This is oh, what you like, pick. Alex. Okay, Power yeah. Pack, Into the Storm, number one from Marvel, written by Louise Simonson, art by June Brigman. Let's bring back the original team that created Power Pack back in the day to do a sequel series that's set in the original continuity. So you got Power Pack. They're not aged up. They're not oldies. They're just kids who have their Louise. powers secret from their parents. Franklin Richards, still a little kid who has dream Maybe. powers. Most of his powers have been locked by his parents, the Fantastic Four. And uh, yeah, there are snarks. There's chameleons. And there's a bunch of space stuff going on with brood sleezoids. I absolutely love this and i know i'm in the tag for it anyway two things that i will say about this in particular i really liked the inking and coloring on here yes. this is not louise yes. uh louise simonson and, and june brigman <laughs> because but it really like took that classic power pack look and brought it into the modern era which i really appreciate yes um, I thought that was absolutely lovely. And Nolan Woodard on the colors. Nice. Great, great stuff. Oh, really good. Just a really nice looking package across the board. But conversely, I will say reading this, I was struck by like, wow, this is for somebody who read Power Pack 40 years ago like me. And if you have not read it in the intervening time, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> This is definitely for like the, hey, I know you like kids being kids having powers, but you know about the alien stuff? Because there's all these horses and lizards who are mad and dealing with their own stuff in space. 
Because I was like, oh, this is so much of that. And also, I got to say, the Fantastic Four come off as sort of like a bit of a family of dicks where like they're like, yeah, we're keeping our kid's brain on lock. So he has weird dreams. We don't know what his deal is. And they're but like, I, oh, you're, I don't know. Your that, kids are in like, space. That's the John Bird era, I believe, if I remember correctly, era of Fantastic Four. And like. This is I, I have zero filter for this because this is my era of reading. This is, you love this. Yeah, yes. I love this. Like I love that Fantastic Four. I still get kind of frustrated that fa- Franklin Richards is not the age that he is in this book because wow, to me, let a child grow. But not in comics. Like none of them get older except for children. Those are the only characters that get any older and they grow up and that like become adults. And everybody else is like, I'm the same age. Meanwhile, but Franklin, well, Richards, everyone might be dying. The, everyone might be dying their hair. Potentially, the Franklin Richards I think is so much more interesting if he has like this threat of these overwhelming powers that are going to come out. And there's only one thing that's holding him back. I love seeing him interact with the power pack and everything. So again, I'm in the tank for this. I know not everybody is. Just again, further clarification, my son was asking about it. He was like, oh, that new Power Pack series is coming out. He's nine years old. And he was like, would I like that? And I was like, I don't think so. <laughs> you need to know, read he... my entire stack of old Power Pack issues before you understand the power a, stack. a single thing that's going on here. Well, uh, he's a he's a continuity head though, so maybe he'll. Yeah. Uh, Justin, I wanted to just uh, what you were saying. Uh, when, you know, when you thought that I thought you were going to say, well, they're dying on the inside. Um, yeah, but I I think that the the <laughs> art on this is really impressive because it it not only does it feel like it has that cartoonish kind of side to it a little bit, but also it's. Uh, sophisticated it, the range of the art that where it doesn't feel like different art but can kind of pull off different uh tones is very impressive in this i was just really blown away by uh artistically the the kind of range it, it has this kind of young kid hype vibe as well as this kind of like scarier alien world vibe in, in a way that i think is really impressive but let's get back to the idea that all the heroes and villains are dying their hair so they can stay young. I think that's real. And getting like facial peels. Are you? Keeping, I'm sorry. I got to ask. Nothing. Are you making a joke about the fact that Franklin Richard does dye his hair? Because he does. No, continuity. I'm saying you're, you're saying like only kids age. And I'm saying like, well, it's harder to tell when adults age because they uh, okay. say the same you know, size. So yes. they just need to dye their Not uh, features. Not everybody. True. So Not everybody still rocks baby tees like you do. Baby teeth or tees? I have tees. both. Tees. Baby tees. Yeah. I, yes. Oh, just so you know, when I'm you wearing those are going to uh, fall out. By the way, <laughs> I feel like when I turn like 50, what's normal for baby teeth to come out? <laughs> when are you going to grow up? Maybe I have a, to grow you're up. You're a dad. You should know these things. Well, oh, maybe my teeth are my baby teeth are gonna drop when my kids do. You think that's <laughs> is that normal? Simultaneous tooth drop when you're. I'll, tell, I'll, I'll be mad if my daughter's baby teeth fall out before mine. That's oh. <laughs> what a race. <laughs> anyway, I think we could probably say if you are a diehard Power Pack fan, you're gonna love this. Otherwise, I don't know. Yeah, I honestly can't say. <laughs> yeah, did P, did you say anything? Oh, you like the colors too. Yeah, yeah. Green Arrow number eight from DC Comics, written by Joshua Williamson, art by Phil Hester. This is bringing on Green Arrow and his son versus Onomatopoeia, classic Kevin Smith villain coming back mm. here for a twisted crime story. What'd you guys think about this one? Well, this was one of my favorite issues this week. Man, I loved all the twists and turns. Love the art. Love all the action. This is just a power-packed ish. I loved it. It was just so much fun. Uh, Had all the kind of fun, powerful uh, father-son moments in there. Yeah, I just thought this was a blast, an actual actual blast to read. I agree. I liked all the twists and turns in here. Like, it was one of those stories where you're like, hmm. Well, and like, I think it was really smart to have this right after a big time travel arc because, excuse me, light spoiler, we deal with um, the death of a couple, one or more main characters. And so I was like, oh no, how are they gonna figure this out? Maybe there's a time travel. So it's not the usual like, oh, a main character dies, there's no way this is real. 
you you're sort of bought into it a little bit in a smart way. So I really like the story in general. Phil Hester's art is such a nice. Mm-hmm. I like his art in general, and it's a nice throwback to uh, the Onomatopoeia origin story. And then the biggest thing: Have you guys checked out the ad for DC's Sweater Weather event uh, coming up? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, which is in the back man. of this book. Man, they're DC folks. Win- they're winter horny. <laughs> Anybody out there? These covers oh, are no, just no. That's unfair. They're winter horny. They are spring horny. They're summer horny. They are horny all year long. Just I've never seen a swimsuit event in the dead of winter. Yeah. <laughs> They're just really going for it. Shouts, yeah. great, good, beautiful, good art. for them. Star Trek Defiant Annual 2024 from IDW, written by Christopher Cantwell, art by Ramon Rosanas. This is giving us a solo tale of Scylla, I believe, who is the daughter of Tasha Yar. Spoilers sort of. here. Sort of. Yeah, it's complicated as they get into it, this issue because she discovers some time travel technology and accidentally ends up teaming up with her sort of mother from another timeline. I went into this a little hesitant because I've been a little back and forth about all of the Star Trek books. Sometimes they're really good. Sometimes they're okay. Tasha Yar, very similar to the power pack thing. Like I love Tasha Yar yeah. and I love. We're the tank for Yar. I'm in the tank. I'm in the tank for tank. Tosh. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm, I'm moshing for Tosh, you know, I just thought this was great. Like I thought this was really good diving into a very specific character issue with classic weird time travel stuff from Star Trek, but I thought this was really smartly done. Really like this issue a lot. Yeah, I agree. This is a fun issue about a badass lady here. The time jumping around kind of fucked my head a little bit. About a badass lady. <laughs> you got a you got a problem with me? No, it just sounds cool. No, it just okay. sounds he likes the way you talk. Yeah. Um yeah, a nice amount of action, especially I'm for a Star Trek. Horny cup. Right now, listening to <laughs> Alex is winter horny for your voice right now. Uh, Yeah, I was really impressed with the amount of action in this Star Trek comic. You know, usually you don't get a lot. So I thought this was uh, an enjoyable amount of action. I I really uh, was pleasantly surprised with this issue. Um, I agree. I like this a lot, too. Uh, I'm uh, in the tank for Tosh as well, just from the Tosh TNG, tank. the Tosh tank, uh, Tosh.0, uh, Tosh 2.0 is what we get, we're getting here, The uh, from the original uh, Next Generation series with Tasha. Uh, but the, I think across the board, the Star Trek line that's been running lately has just been really smart about how they use all of the characters in the canon and are building this continuity while at the same time just always being like what is the most fun version of this and the art's great too um fantastic and pete just real quick could you say winter horny just really slowly though no for okay. for his ringtone for, uh, yeah just it's i've been wanting ringtone. to get a new ringtone. superior spider-man number three. <laughs> oh boy this thing where you <laughs> Push us forward. <laughs> Not loving it, Pete. Superior <laughs> Spider-Man number three for Marvel, written by Dan Slott, art by Mark Bagley in this issue. Wait, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, Alex. Pete, does that happen when you're at work? Are you like, all right, let's move on to new business <laughs> when someone says something that you don't want to talk about? Yeah. Like at your, if you're at work and someone says, say winter horny really slowly, <laughs> that would which, happen at which, work. It does. Ha- this is work. Yeah. <laughs> this is work and it happened we're all getting paid for this wow oh, you're right you're a lot right. of money you ever thought about that you ever thought about that pete this is work um, yeah well anyway in this issue spider-man is teaming up with doc ock to save the life of anna maria from a new villain who was semi-accidentally created by doc ock back in the day and in order to do so Peter Parker has to pretend to be the superior Spider-Man leading up to a moment you knew was going to happen. And even Peter Parker knew it was going to happen. Uh, Dan Slott is having so much fun with this book and Spider-Boy. It is a joy to read both of these series. For me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, there was a pause there. So I suddenly yeah, thought no, like, uh, maybe not you guys too. I thought Pete was going to talk, but he's warming up his voice for our request. Uh, the, <laughs> the sweater weather. 
<laughs> winter horny new ringtone. <laughs> These are all great ringtone options. If anyone out there has a need for that, I mean, I agree. Dan Scott is having fun. This is what he wants to be doing. It just feels like literally Peter Parker has to draw on a whiteboard what <laughs> happened before to set up what's happening. So again, and maybe this is just me right now in comics having a lot of continuity fatigue with so many stories being reliant on like, okay. And then walking us through all the backstory that gets us to our moments. And this just has a lot of that. Uh, so I, I like the, uh, the way that we're getting back into it through um, Doc Ock's uh, love that he had when he was in Peter Parker's body. I like that's a fun idea, but there are just so many backflips to get to it. Yeah, I mean, this is not enjoyable for me just because I don't want to see uh, I don't want to see Doc Ock be Spider Man. I don't want to see a Spider Man being a dick to people and uh, mistreating them. So this is not enjoyable for me at all. Uh, the art's good. Oh, so sad. Uh, you're like, what's the opposite of winter horny? Winter flaccid. Just winter. <laughs> Just, just, just regular just winter. winter. Just <laughs> you just uh, winter without the horny part. Yeah, that made me sad to hear it. But I'm having a good time <laughs> reading this book. Let's move on to talk about The Flash, number five from DC Comics, written by Cy Spurrier, art by Mike Diodato Jr. In this issue, we're focusing on Wally West's son, who has very different powers, very different powers than The Flash. But uh, through his perspective, we get to see what Wally West is up to, what other members of the Flash family are up to. This series is so unique. This is unlike any Flash book I've ever read. I'm really enjoying it. It is tense. It's sporadically funny in sort of like a nervous laughter sort of way throughout. And yeah. The villains are scary and weird. There's a scene here with Grodd where he confronts uh, Wally West's son that I thought was so unique and interesting. This is great. I agree. I, I'm loving this this Cy Spurrier run. If you're a Flash fan and have been sort of like not reading lately, this is a great one to come back and just see like new creative ideas about what the Speed Force can do, what the Flash family is up to, exploring an area where Wally West – his usual like bright persona is being infected by a by a certain exhaustion with the life as a speedster which i think it's just like great it's really smart storytelling this issue through the eyes of his son so him looking at his dad who's clearly going through something he's going through something we get some characters talking about how he how uh the son uh jai is his name i believe yeah uh is like is perhaps Jack maybe the Jack Courtney. yeah the the most powerful uh flash potentially or speedster potentially so like just so many great ideas here and told in a very unique way and great mike diodato art yeah the art's unbelievable i i really think that uh the some creepy cool covers i really loved uh, the bunch of the covers uh that they have with this um yeah, I mean, it's it's an uh, interesting story. Overall, I really thought it was cool. I just, I don't know, the, uh, it's a little Stranger Danger where you got like a kid just hanging out with some dude for a little while. And I was just From like, the future. Yeah, I was just like, uh, this, this freaks me out. But uh, other than that, enjoyable for a Flash comic, which uh, I was surprised by. Guys, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, is Simon Spurrier and Cy Spurrier the same <laughs> person or is that two different people yes they're the same person he's credited differently for different publishers i believe which may have something to do with his contracts not 100 percent sure but yeah. oh, okay. size short for si simon it's like if we called you I, I just wasn't sure if it was like uh if i was going insane or everybody was also uh, nope. okay okay it's p al and Jus just <laughs> hanging out doing the show <laughs> okay cool Next up, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 147 from IDW, written by Sophie Campbell, art by Vincenzo Federici. We haven't been regularly following this title, but I thought it was worth starting to check in with this because we we're leading up to the 150th issue and then switching over to Jason Aaron with a new number one that apparently is not going to ignore the continuity of the previous series. So 
personally, I just want to know what the continuity is, and it is <laughs> wild right yeah, now. Yeah, this is yeah. Uh, not a good jumping on point, I would say. No, certainly not, as the turtles, some of the turtles are traveling through time. There's a big evil space Sad. whale, I want to say, who is eating um, time and attacking people. Yeah, it's a space Armagon. whale. Yeah, yep. you can say that, yeah. And it's like a space yeah, dragon whale. At the end, whale. they tra- dragon whale. the future. There's a dragon gibbon, whale. I want to say, a gibbon man who's with them as well. Gibbon. Who seem, gibbon, mm-hmm. who seems mm-hmm. key. Um, he seems less teenage also. Tough continuity yeah. hurdle, but at the same time, I thought the art – was very good when feeling modern, but also feeling like classic turtles. And despite not having a good sense of what go- is going on, I still think like I got the emotional connections there. And that's the sign of a good comic book. If you can tell what these characters mean to each other, even if you're not 100% sure about the plot that's going on around them. Yeah, I mean, the family element, like in Fast and Furious, is really important to Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Mm. Another series where the plot is insane. Yeah, (laughs) Uh, but yeah, this is kind of heartbreaking to see them all kind of old and beat up and kind of... uh, Well, Raph. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, my guy Raph. It was heartbreaking to see him like that. And it's a bummer because, like, once they get that old, the meat gets too tough. So you really harder to eat. No, no, I had to really live through this bullshit one time. I'm not going to do it twice. For those of you wondering what what, Ah! what Alex is talking Ah! about, I'm going to say if you'd like Ah! to hear a continuation of this. Of this eating the turtles conversation. The microphone. People at home are pissed at me. Stop. I'm not. I'm not Stop gonna. It. I'm not gonna talk about. it. I was just telling them where they could go if they wanted to hear more about eating these turtles. Yeah. So on our live show. You wanna go where you could eat a <laughs> teenage mutant? Stop it, bah, bah, Ninja bah, Turtle. Bah, 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 bah. <laughs> uh, so let me talk about this book. Uh, I really like the the character we reveal at the end is a character I've uh, liked in the books we've read featuring her, which is cool. Yeah. Yeah. The the continuity Long is a hurdle. Is a hurdle, but they're all the story. Even though we don't really know, I it's don't know what's hurdle. going on. It's turtle hurdle, yeah. turtle hurdle. <laughs> the uh, the continuity is a hurdle for me, turtle hurdle. But uh, the, it's all rooted in great emotional storytelling. So I appreciate that, and I like this. I'm excited, especially with all of the news coming out about the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles line that's been covered on our Comic Book Club News podcast um, that Alex swears a lot through. Uh, turns out. <laughs> Uh, which is great. So no, definitely no. check Wait, it can out. Can I clarify that? Because nobody's asked me about that, and I was curious. So I Marvel announced that they ha- are doing Blood Hunt Red Bad yes. Mature issues, um, nice. where they're going to release five extra pages of Pepe Larraz art. So on the podcast, I bleeped out a bunch of stuff. I have a Red Bad Mature version of it <laughs> that is unbleeped. If anybody wants it, I'll send it to you. Um, yeah, and, uh, send it you to can, the you people. You can check out if there's actual cursing on there or not. Maybe there. Wow, a red is. band better. podcast. Yeah, can you imagine yeah. a less needed thing? A red <laughs> band. Podcast? Yeah, well, I thought about uploading it, and I was like, nobody, nobody cares. <laughs> people swear regularly on podcasts yeah. and but talk about whatever they want. Maybe like, not. like Maybe this not. podcast. I don't know. The immortal Thor. Oh my God! Where do you need to go? What what are you busy with? The Immortal Thor number six from Marvel, written by Al Ewing, art by Martin Coquello. Picking up after the first arc, we are now finally moving into exploring more of what's been going on behind the scenes of this entire series. We've got Dario, the head of Roxxon, who is a very quickly rotting Minotaur, who is teaming Love up that. with Enchantress and another character that I'm blanking on. They are, they have been reading a Thor comic book. And in this issue, Thor and Loki sit down and go through a story from their past. We are finding out more about both of these things at the same time. Time, excuse me. Um, I thought this issue was great. I thought the art was absolutely gorgeous from Martin Coccolo. Yes. I love a good Norse mythology type story. And this Uber story they're telling with whatever's going on with the villains is so interesting. They announced as we're taping today that it seems like they're going to be splitting Thor into two different series, immortal Thor and Roxxon presents Thor. And oh, that's I awesome. love that idea. Like just 
you know, we give a shout out to Al Ewing and just his storytelling on Resurrection of Magneto. Same thing here. He's writing a very like Neil Gaiman esque story about stories having to do with Thor. And I think that's such a smart thing to do when you're coming to a mythological character. Really, really enjoying the series. Yeah, I think the 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 art, like you said, is just really unbelievable. It's got this really cool old timey feel to it, but it still uh, uh, doesn't. Uh, uh, it's more modern than that, but it has that uh, kind of feel to it. Uh, also, it gets a little meta at the end, which is a little not enjoyable. But other than that, uh, I love the kind of uh, brother back and forth that Thor and Loki are having throughout this issue. Uh, very enjoyable. I love the meta move at the end. It feels like that's the uh, sort of the overarching idea of what they're getting at is that it depends on who's telling your story and the advantage of controlling the story that a lot of uh, perhaps corporate interests take in our modern world. So there's some interesting ideas at play there potentially. But the other thing, like I feel like we've seen a lot of like Thor stories within stories where a a storyteller is like, and that, let's yeah. hear this legend of Thor. What I like about this is the twist is that the in-story Thor can often be like, wait, did I really say that? And then the, uh, the Thor and Loki who are sort of telling the story to each other then talk about it. And that, that to me is, it, it feels more alive and more at like an actual story being told rather than just a framing device for a comic. So really like this. Two things that I'll throw out there. One, I do wonder, based on this issue, how much Thor and Loki are aware of what Dario and everybody else are doing, because it almost feels like they know what's up and they are manipulating the story without saying it out loud and are actually two steps ahead of them. Potentially, just throwing that out there. The other thing is, I wonder how far Al Ewing could take this in terms of commenting on how Marvel Comics writes about and publishes Thor, because my guess is not very far, not far yeah. in the direction <laughs> yeah. of like really criticizing it in any way. And that's the thing that I'd really be curious to see is something that is say greater, something greater about how comic publishing treats these ongoing characters in terms of society, in terms of how we develop as people, allowing them to grow. And I don't know, I, I guess we'll see. It's a pretty bold take so far. I'm excited to see how it goes. Speaking yeah. of bold takes, the Penguin number six from DC Comics, written hey. by Tom King, art by Stevin Subic. After the first couple of issues have shown the Penguin heading towards Gotham City to retake the criminal underworld here, we're jumping all the way back in time to a young, fresh penguin just figuring it all mm. out teaming up with batman for the first time and ultimately working against him another great great issue of this great great series this goes exactly the way you think it's going to go but it's so horrifying slash satisfying what it ultimately does just another issue perfectly done and steven subic who did the Riddler Year One series that was so awesome. Um, yes. Great addition on art. Really, really interesting looking young Penguin in particular, but I, I like this issue. Agreed. Like, I thought this was great. Yeah, you can feel it, the story coming, and it's still, it. rather than being uh, a problem that we sort of can see what's maybe happening, it's really nice. We're really on board with the Penguin at his absolute lowest when we see him, and seeing him coming up and and working it like becoming a batman villain sort of through batman in as opposed to so many villains become a batman rogue by opposing him penguin sort of rose through him in a way that i think is really unique and smartly done just a fantastic issue and did you guys check out the sweater weather preview in the back <laughs> oh of this <laughs> it's pretty crazy it was making uh, me no, pretty winter horny is that something i've never heard that term before pete could right. you talk about that yeah, term could you say that real really quick? slowly for my so this ringtone? this issue is uh, you know it's it's hard because these penguin issues he's such a non-likable villain and then just having him in this issue just be a rat 
And I'm just like, man, fuck this guy. Why do I want to spend time with this asshole? So are you on I, the side of the Falcones in this issue? Or are you yeah. like, yeah. Who, are you, who are you rooting yeah. for? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you like time. big crime. You're more of a big crime guy. More of a big crime guy myself. Yeah. But yeah, man, unbelievable <laughs> art. The art on that, and this makes it worth it. <laughs> That's really funny because Falcone's the narrator for like a fair amount of it, and he's yeah. such a maniac. <laughs> Pete, I love that Pete. You're like now that guy's yeah, speaking. That guy. Life. Let's do a fucking thing about this guy. Uh, <laughs> this is. I know Pete's probably going to get mad at me for even saying this, but contrasting this with the Wonder Woman series that I I've liked and appreciated a lot of the stuff that they're doing. The Tom King series, you're saying. The Tom King Wonder Woman series, but it always feels to me every issue like they're there's almost they're holding the reins like they're holding it back being like this is where the action wanted us to go but we're taking our time we're just stepping back from the action it's not happening in this issue wait until next issue the anticipation is working the right way for me in this penguin series even with this enormous step backwards in time this fleshes out the relationship between him and Batman, gets back to that initial scene of Batman and Penguin drowning and dying in the Batplane. Oh, I forgot Penguin, about that. Yeah, as Penguin is about to get back to Gotham City, I love the pace of this. I, this is working yeah. absolutely perfectly for me. Let's move on and talk about Holy Roller number three from Image Comics, written by Rick Remender, Andy Samberg, and Joe Troman, art by Roland Bosky. This is following a guy who is Andy Samberg as he fights back against Nazis in his hometown. In this issue, he gets thrown in jail. He is sort of on his back legs a little bit, but gets it back uh, and gets a new enemy in terms of his initial enemy's father. Um, yeah, Pete, I think this was one of your favorite issues of the week. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. I enjoyed this. It wasn't one of my favorite issues of the All week. Right. We'll, we'll get there uh, eventually to the other one. Uh, but uh, I do think that this is uh, fun. And I also like the kind of uh, call the action hero moment where we got the kind of fun shadow of like him uh, uh, kind of dressed up as a superhero. So I thought that was really well earned in this. Also, just anytime you're punching Nazis, I'm having a great time. You know what I mean? That's just, it's one of those villains I never get tired of. So, uh, hey, if you got to punch someone, punch a Nazi. You know what I mean? Yeah, you and most of American storytelling, I think, is the same. Uh, the I, I think this is a very much a, uh, we're seeing the moment when Uncle Ben dies we're seeing the when oh, the wayne gets his rice nope different <laughs> uncle ben i don't know if he got that rice <laughs> the when uh when that, the wayne wasn't that the whole idea uncle ben's on the cover of the rice and he's like oh he wants to get that rice I'll and the kids are rice. like no way rice is for kids yeah, he's like a Mr. Wilson to the yeah, kids who love Mr. rice. <laughs> that, <laughs> yep, like volleyball? Dennis Fam the Menace. The, the, famous, the famous cereal mascot, Mr. Wilson. <laughs> <laughs> Yum. Dennis the Menace. -ios. No, what I'm trying to say is like the, the this issue ends with that like character defining, I'm a hero now. I'm right. going to go fight in a way that is nice. Th this, is, this comic is just so violent in a way that I'm like, it feels because it's it's dressed a little bit like a comic comic and then it's just horrifyingly violent on both sides of the hero and villain side so that's constantly surprising but i do like the story uh and the art is really good it's fun i i don't love this and the reason i don't love this is this feels like the sort of thing that is paced out like ultimate spider-man which at this point came out what 20 years ago something like that what, you where you can't do a fucking 20 years young Spider-Man knockoff 20 years later <laughs> i don't know Fuck. there's been a lot of changes in storytelling like that since then including from rick remender who is one of the three writers on this book just the idea <laughs> that we're three issues in and we're probably not going to see him in costume until issue six kind of feels to me like i don't know let's pace it up a little bit uh, it's very funny that Pete, the way you see the way you sound right now is like you went to get a beer and you're like, hey, what? You can't get an ultimate spider rip off, guys. Come on. Come on. Hey, Do whatever you want. We got, you got an ultimate Spider-Man back here? 
Go Ultimate Spider-Man. Hey, did Spider-Man. anybody else remember that? Ultimate Dad. Spider-Man? Now, that Who was ordered the story. wings? Who ordered the wings? Because the wings are here. Come on and get the wings. <laughs> Al, Chuss. It's me, P. The wings are here. Uh, when, uh, for a little bit of transparency for anybody listening to the podcast, when Pete disagrees with an opinion, we put him in the next room. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Go to the bedroom. Yeah, same for all of us, honestly. If we disagree, yeah, oh, no, with, if I, I disagree with an opinion, I go to another room. Justin. And for thing. those of you that don't know, I record my basement, and so when I give a bad opinion, I stand in the corner like the end of the Blair Witch Project, <laughs> <laughs> face the wall until I'm murdered for that take. I was really hoping you were going to address the giant peanuts of violin that you have behind you. Ah, uh, yes, that's uh, Pigpen's uh, base <laughs> <laughs> right behind me. This is sort of my Batman's rogue, the bat cave behind yeah, me. Yeah, the giant pennies behind you, yeah. yeah. That's, that's My giant penny is Pigpen's <laughs> styrofoam base uh, behind me. Uh, that was that's for the first true. time you defeated Pigpen. Yeah, <laughs> Big Ben keeps he keeps coming back. <laughs> He's so filthy. He is like a Batman. <laughs> Next up, Punisher number three from Marvel, written by David Propose, art by Dave Wachter. In this issue, after finding out that he uh, there was a, a little bit of a flip in terms of what our new Punisher thought about how his family died. We're jumping forward in time slightly so that he's now facing Mr. Fear's daughter, I believe, um, while unraveling... Fear Master. Fear Master, Fear Master, excuse me. While he is unraveling the mystery of what happened to his family a little bit for the cops. Um, Pete, you're our Punisher fan, not to keep going to you, but what'd you think about this one? Well, this was fun. Uh, great action. Um, you know, so we got this kind of like fighting fear master. And then, uh, you know, we get this fun Punisher line where it's like, I don't fear easy. And I was like, all right, okay. Uh, but fun uh, villain reveal at the end. Um, spoilers. But uh, it's a Jigsaw. So I'm curious if it's going to be the jigsaw we know or maybe a kind of red mask uh jigsaw type of situation going on or a completely different jigsaw because this is a different punisher so um i'm excited to see kind of what happens i feel like uh to take your your question pete i think uh david the two daves who work on this book are really remixing the whole thing this feels like this is a totally different jigsaw for this new punisher which is I like the idea of sort of remapping all of the Punisher, not just the the main man himself, but the whole story across the board in a fun way. So so that part's cool. I think the art uh, by Dave Wachter is very good here. Yeah. Let and, me ask you, though, when you saw the puzzle piece where you were like, oh, Jigsaw, I thought it was going to be like the puzzler or, you know, something, you know, because it's got that one piece. I, I do wonder why, and just to get straight into spoilers for the end of the issue because we spoiled it already, but new Punisher Joe Garrison gets a text of a puzzle piece and he's like, what is Jigsaw? And I absolutely, if I saw that, would not be like, that's Never. Jigsaw. I'd be like, that's puzzle piece, like you yeah, said. Yeah, that's the puzzler or, you know, mm-hmm. we got to figure out this new mystery because we got one little piece of it here. Right. I, yeah, the fact that he looked at that symbol and was like, who's Jigsaw? I was like, how the fuck did you get there? <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe he got a second text. Oh, like, okay. Maybe yeah, he this, just this scrolled, scrolled down. Yeah. To be fair, he's looking uh, at FYI. it on a phone. He's looking at it on a phone from like like 2003. It's like a it's like a Verizon chocolate. He's looking at it. On. <laughs> oh, so yeah, like yeah. It, it could be he could have just T nine down. Not even like one of those. I I really or... like the nightmare landscapes that Dave Wachter draws throughout the yeah, issue. Yes. This feels to me, and I don't say this dismissively, but it feels to me like a Batman versus Scarecrow issue. Pretty much strained up in terms of the way it executes, but very well done there for that. I, and this is another spoiler. I feel very torn about the fact that Joe Garrison killed this new villain because I feel like this was such a good, clear new villain that I was like, okay, this is a great addition to the Marvel Universe. Reading the entire issue, I was like, ah, this is the Punisher. The Punisher would kill this villain, and then the Punisher 
does kill this villain, which logically makes yeah. sense and is story wise, I think, the right thing for David Popose to do. But at the same time, it's like, but you just came up with this good villain. You made a good villain. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's the essential problem with a punish any Punisher in the Marvel universe is like, of course, the Punisher should have killed Kingpin by right now. Like straight up. Every big villain in the Marvel Universe should be dead because the Punisher should have killed him, but he can't do that because of comic book storytelling. So, I don't know. I, I felt that push and pull a little bit in this issue. Yeah, I think that's fair. Um, but the, especially the Batman Scarecrow of it all and the Jigsaw, because for me, when I saw that puzzle piece, I was like, is the Riddler coming now? What's <laughs> happening here? Uh, but that's all right. I've been enjoying the series. Why don't we move Definitely. on yeah, to definitely. our Beast World block, as we always yeah, do. Yeah, let's Titans go Beastie. Beast World, number five from DC Comics, written by Tom Taylor, art by Ivan Rice and Eduardo Pensica. And then we'll also be talking about another issue after that. But let's focus on this main series first, which has some big revelations. Big. Spoilers, so specifically, we find out the identity of Dr. Hate after last issue. Seems like he's actually dead. They killed Gar Logan, a.k.a. Garo, a.k.a. Gar the Conqueror. They also called killed Chester P. Runk by blowing him up and turning him into Black Hole, which is kind of upsetting. Agreed. Uh, I yeah. like that character from uh, Flash World. Uh -huh. he's, a, got a, he's got a black hole in his body. Yeah, and Amanda Waller then uses that to pivot into killing a million beast people, which the Titans managed to stop, leading to confrontation at the end here and the reveal of Dr. Hate. What do you guys think about this issue? Well, first off, uh, Peacemaker was hilarious in this issue. I think it's important to bring that up. But, yeah, I really am enjoying the fun twists and turns in this. And uh, this just continues to be a fun nonstop roller coaster ride where you think, like, okay, this is going to settle down, but keeps kind of turning it up to 11. So I'm having a blast, amazing art, and it keeps getting crazier and crazier. So this is fun. I like the Dr. Hate reveal. I feel like it centers the story where we want it to be, like right in the Titans. This is such a Titan story. And especially all the Waller stuff. We're elevating Waller so hard. She is now the Lex Luthor of the DC Universe. And this is a big bureaucracy, like media play here in a way that I thought is, um, is nice, making the Titans, putting the Titans they've been elevated to being the Justice League since the Justice League has been sort of off the table. And then to sort of put them on the outs seemingly going forward is, I think, a really interesting place for them to be, especially with Nightwing being a focus there, someone who is always big, bright, and always on the right side of right. I agree with you on all that. I really liked the Nightwing Amanda Waller scenes in particular. There's a really nice ideological difference between the two of them. And the fact that Nightwing's play is to say, hey, I'm going to go talk to her and see if we could yeah. just yeah. figure this out. I thought was such a smart, different way of hitting it that points to... What DC is trying to do, they're trying to show a difference between how the Titans would handle things and how the Justice League would handle things. And I really love that a bunch. Yeah. That said, my issue, and I think uh, Justin, at the very least, you had this issue as well with the last issue, uh, not to keep saying the word issue. Um, <laughs> this needed to be double the length. Like reading this issue felt right. like mm -hmm. fast forwarding through scenes at certain points and... I don't know. I want to spend time with Gar Logan died. And what does that mean to these characters? I want to spend time with the confrontation with Peacemaker, which was very fun. Um, yeah. I want to spend time with the fact that like, oh, there are no more spores and we just have a million beast people running around in the world. There's not enough room to play with any of those ideas. And frankly, it feels like they're not even really dealing with those ideas in any of the spinoff titles. So I'm not getting that, okay, you're skipping by it because we deal with it in X one shot or this mini series right. or anything like that, which is usually how these things operate. Instead, it just feels way too fast to me. It'd be nice if there was one like corollary series that was mm -hmm. like the boots on the ground version of it, where we have the top level stuff like this issue, and then a series completely dedicated to the fight against the spores and the animalized heroes and villains, because that would be awesome. 
Would you yeah, say it's too fast and too furious? Wow. Absolutely. What have you Let, been watching? Let's move on to the other Beast World title this week. Yeah, Titans. more Beast World. More Beast World 2, Beast World 2, Green Arrow, Titans Beast World Tour, Star City number one from DC Comics, written by Joshua Williamson, Ryan Parrott, Robert Venditti, Brent and Stein, uh, who are the creators, not the monster, to be clear. Art by Jamal Campbell, Roger Cruz, Gavin Guidry, and Brent and Stein. Again, the same joke that I made earlier that everybody loves. Oh, man. <laughs> so glad we called that out again. <laughs> anyway, this is taking over to Star City, where all of the, the people use arrows all of the time to shoot mm. things. Or and uh, Pete, you, you like arrows. Yeah, yeah, I'm just sorry. I'm just frustrated with you comedically. After all these years, you would think <laughs> you would learn that, like, with one joke doesn't work, you know, get rid of it. But you like to go, like, if I hit it 18 more times, then mm -hmm. it becomes funny. Anyways, so, okay. This so, is an inherent uh, difference between you two. Yeah. It seems yeah. Like. It, lovely. What did you think I, about the fact that Brant and Stein in their story said that fire bad? So the animal designs in this are so much fun. Like I love seeing the animal slash monster versions of the heroes and villains and stuff that we're getting, or just kind of people in the world. Uh, I, I just have such a blast with it. It seems like they're having fun with all the designs and they look really cool. Uh, the fights just are that much more enjoyable. Love all the action in this issue. This is a nonstop action-packed issue great art this is just a fantastic delivery on an idea yeah really great art throughout i i liked the star girl story it was really nice yeah. the red canary story i thought was cool black canary gets birded up she birded becomes up. a big old big bird she's big bird uh, <laughs> And uh, and then we have sort of a, a, a story that's book ending where um, there's just a lot of other animal stuff happening. Yeah, I it's my same issue as Titans issue. as the previous issue. The mm -hmm. this ends with like to be continued in Beast World number six. And my main reaction after reading this is like, will it? I mean, will we see Black Canary as a giant canary again? I don't know, because most of the other things mostly haven't been followed up on. So to the point yeah. you were making, they're Justin. they're going to start, though. They're going to start. This needed, this needed more. Like, this needed more heft behind it. Um, mm. And I'm sure there was some sort of bean counter thing of like, hey, if you do too many of these Beast World things, we're not going to sell them. But legitimately, I think, like, as a comic book fan and as somebody who reads a lot of this DC stuff, like we, well, the three of us do on this podcast, when DC goes whole hog at an event, I think they do it really well. Like they really get every piece of it and every aspect of it. And this this feels a little half-hearted to me. I'm not quite Yeah, but it sometimes it's nice to just not have this peak about the other room. Event. Or the other room okay. okay. It's nice to not have this giant event sometimes. Like just have a small event that mm -hmm. only runs a couple. And Hang. It's like a little crazy, but then, you know, eventually wears off. So, like, I don't know. It doesn't always have to be an 85 series tie in issue with, you know, all, you know, it could just be like a 10 issue run and we have a little fun with some one shots here and there and that's it. You know? See, that's not like me. I only throw giant wedding Majors. receptions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, never do I have. Yeah, well, always past hors d'oeuvres. Everyone gets chicken. Like, everybody <laughs> rides. You know what this, I'm talking this about? This event is all fish, no chicken. I guess that's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> Spider-Woman number three from Marvel, written by Steve Fox, art by Corolla Borelli. Spider-Woman has been looking for her son at the same time fighting in the gang war. We've had an issue with this comic that it hasn't brought these two storylines together. Spoilers here. It does, in it fact. Does. And uh, I'll, I'll take it a step further. I called it with the first issue. The whole point of this was they wanted to age up Spider-Woman's son because comic books cannot deal with kids. This ties back to the Franklin, yeah. Franklin Richards thing I was mentioning earlier. They just cannot deal with it. And it drives me a little nuts because, like, 
Spider Woman being a single mom with a baby, that's interesting. And there's a innumerable amount of stories you could write about that. You don't need to turn him into a adult supervillain. I liked the way it was paced out. I liked the reveal at the end of the issue. I thought that was well done. But at the same time, that basic trope drives me a little mm. insane. But did you like the section where Spider Woman, Madam Web, and Diamondback all dye their hair because they're also getting older? <laughs> I did like that. Yes, because <laughs> I think that explains a lot of why. The are you? Old. Do you get like a little taste of just the men for what's going on with you? Like, are you getting like back end deals? <laughs> I'm, that I'm getting back end. Riley trying to, you know, like yeah, mention he's, other. He's, he's wet in his beak. He's wet in his beak. I'm wet in his. I'll give a beak wet. Was that something we said on this? What what last podcast? Week, is this? Last, last week. week. I'm getting my beak wet. A no, normal thing that we it. say when we're getting money, I guess. <laughs> I love to get the tip of my nose just moist with money. Dipping I, my nose into money. That's I got, my beak. As much as I hate to say this, I got to agree with Zalbatron a little bit here. The old, like... Uh, you've been fighting your son reveal is a little like, Meh. you know, um, but uh, I've been enjoying this up until that kind of reveal. So, you know, one wrong move. I'm not, I don't hate the whole thing, but um, I just feel like, you know, we've seen this play out numerous times before. And it's, of course, it's your son. Did you get seeing Madam Webb get you hyped for the movie, Madam Webb? No, <laughs> no, it didn't. Because we do see her in full yeah. red trench you, coat. Yeah, you're re real excited about the Madam Web of it all, huh? Yeah. Are no, you a Madam no. Webhead? I'm a Madam Webhead. I'm okay. a Webhead. A Madam Web. <laughs> <laughs> the most disappointing follow up uh, in the world. Hey, oh, I'm a huge Webhead. Web ah, Madam Webhead. Madam Webhead. Yeah. Do you surf the web? The Madam Web. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's, that's the only web I'm interested in on. <laughs> February 14th, I want to say. Yeah. The Valentine's Day. The, uh, I, I mean, I agree. This this story, I think now it's at a point where I'm like, okay, now it, everything makes sense. Let's start here. I think there's a chance for this to be mm -hmm. interesting. I mean, there's a chance she can, like, they're very, Diamondback's very coy about how they aged her son up. <laughs> like, it's like, we have ways of doing that. I was like, you have ways of aging a child to te to adulthood? Why? Why would you do that? Why would you work on that? Why, Why that? would that be a project? That's not a, something anyone it's wants. It's already, ha like, happening. Like, people are getting older. <laughs> <We're> getting older. <laughs> Why is your oh, gang focused on aging people faster? Diamond back. what are you doing yeah. with your resources? So what are you doing? Are you uh, selling drugs, running illegal gambling? <laughs> Nope, we're aging. Aging, up kids. <laughs> we're aging, aging up speeding kids. up the natural flow. You of know, because it always sucks. Uh, you know, kids are too young. You know, so <laughs> aging them up. Yeah, kids always want to buy beer at the convenience store. We give them an easy way of doing it. <laughs> now we they turn, can. We make them twenty-one. A <laughs> uh, great way to hey, truly hey, break kid, the law. Want to be twenty-one? I sure do. Yeah. Maybe <laughs> maybe Diamondback saw the movie Big and was like, fuck yes. I want to be that machine. I'm going to do that shit. I want to be so Zoltar. Hard. I'm Zoltar. I'm the criminal. I'm the human Zoltar. Zoltar. <laughs> if next issue's reveal is that Diamondback has a room full of Zoltar machines. Yeah. Oh, my God. Oh, I'm going to lose my shit. <laughs> that would be the greatest reveal of all time. It would. I would quit comics. I would absolutely be like, this isn't going to get better than this. Time back as a room full of I'm Zoltars. I'm retired from Zoltars. comics. He's like, first you get the Zoltars, then you get the <laughs> aged up kids, and then you're running every toy company in Manhattan. Oh, and all yeah. these little teenage yeah. boys are fucking adult women. <laughs> just like the movie what? Big. That's what happens in the movie Big. <laughs> We're going to make a fortune a on giant patterns <laughs> and, and baseball gloves that they use to touch their boobs. <laughs> and let's be fair. Remember, one of the big innovations that Tom Hanks comes up with is a comic book where the adventure changes every time oh, in the movie Big. And I wish that we had that now so we could change this story so it made more sense. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really rooting for this comic book. Honestly, I like Steve Fox. I think Carilla Borelli's yeah. art, uh, as we mentioned, every issue is very good. She's drawing a really good or he's drawing a really good. I'm not honestly sure uh spider woman um 
So yeah. I don't know. I think to your point, now that we're past this reveal, maybe we can get into what this comic book is. So very curious to read issue number four. Here's one that you won't be able to read more of. Damn them all. Number 12 from Boob Studios written by Cy Spurrier, not Simon Spurrier. Art by mm. Charlie. Well, Adlard. it is written by Simon Spurrier. This is the final issue of this title that is basically a lady version of Constantine doing some magic stuff with some demons. Um, I <laughs> will throw out there. I like this comic. It got insanely complicated by the end here, yeah. but the standout, at least of this last issue to me was Charlie Adlard's art. There's some good action scenes. There's some good demon and angel stuff happening here, but I, I sort of lost track of the plot a little bit. Um, it was a complicated plot. I really like this. It got uh, more complicated. It also got more like British vernacular through a lot of it in a great way. I like the dialogue here. I like the sort of family, uh, the way we threaded the needle with the family connections in this final issue. I really enjoyed this series. Uh, worth a pickup. Yeah, I agree with Justin. I love, as I'm reading a comic, for it to get more British. You know what I mean? As it goes yeah. on. Uh, no, I really think this is... Uh, uh, the ending was great, which then kind of made the confusion and weirdness that I was having before uh, less important. I feel like they really did a great job of landing the ship in here. Uh, amazing art, action. Uh, yeah, this is a very enjoyable comic and overall series. Daredevil Black Armor, number three from Marvel, written by D.G. Chichester, art by Netho Diaz. This is going back in the day to when Daredevil was a more extreme character. Everybody thought he was dead. They thought he was a guy named Jack Batlin. And here he is said to an underground fight ring run by, uh, not Baron Zebo, the other guy. Strucker. Baron Von Strucker. Thank you. They're both Barons, so it's confusing. Hey, I get my Barons mixed up. <laughs> oh, always. And he's fighting under underground, literally, in the Mole Man's caverns. Yeah, uh, the and, yeah there you go. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, Daredevil, Mole World, Mole World, lots of action, uh, lots of evil villains to fight, uh, touching dad stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, I said this last issue. If there's no more '90s comic that Marvel's publishing right now than this, I mean, for, I wish there was a comic about me named after the clothes I'm wearing, like <laughs> Daredevil Black Armor. I want Justin sweatpants. Now, issue number three, like th this issue takes yes. clothes to a whole new level. And later on in this issue, he puts his arm on. He's like, "Hey, this is better." Now my ribs aren't broken as hard. I was like, what a fun. They're really <laughs> owning the armor, black armor nature of this. Um, get that 90s flavor right here. Dude, I can't wait to read Gray Sweatpants, the Justin Tyler story. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be great because I'm different in the sweats, you know? Yeah, yeah. Lotus oh, Land, a... number three for Boob Studios, written by Darcy Van Polgeest, art by Caio Felipe. We are following a retired direct detective, excuse me, who has been pulled back one more time to solve a mystery. Turns out it's a little trippy and more complicated than that and ties back to his son, who, spoilers here, but may not actually be his son, may not actually be real. Per the name, it's very much about memory and loss. Um, I really like this series. This, to me, feels like uh, the art by Caio Felipe, it's not quite as exaggerated, but it feels like a lot of what Gabriel Ba did on Umbrella Ooh. Academy. Ooh, and yeah. it feels like Umbrella Academy meets Blade Runner in certain ways. Mm. So nice. I, I really like the series a lot. It's more evocative term in terms of emotion than even the plot but i'm really feeling it in every single page yeah this was one of my favorites of the week and this was just such a really cool ish freaky but cool uh you get a lot of mo a lot more story in this issue which i'm really happy about and uh yeah i just uh love the art i feel like this is a total package uh enjoy the art as well a little i don't quite understand all of the action but uh, i do like the world and the vibe hmm. what's that to understand about action 
<laughs> I just don't know what's happening. Just feel the vibe, man. Feel it's the, the simplest thing to understand. You know what I mean? Yeah. You don't okay, like John, walk me through. With... Walk me through the healing situation, uh, and then the kid. Uh, sure, sure. Let me just pull it up here, and I can. Uh, we don't have time it. for that. Let's now, you know, get you're just gonna to read the, the last... comic out loud to me. <laughs> I don't need that. <laughs> last title on the stack: Gods, number four from Marvel, written by Jonathan Hickman, art by Valerio Shiti. In this issue, we've got Win, who is a envoy of powers that be. I'm forgetting which. He's one like a it. he's like a Gambit, Doctor Strange. <laughs> That's a great way of describing him. Yeah. And he is teaming up with none other than Doctor Strange to figure out what the in-betweener wants, why this cosmic entity is putting people in boxes and sending them out to do dastardly things in the world. We're also getting a bunch of time travel going on here as Doctor Strange seemingly reverses the same event over yeah. and over, That's so cool. leading to a big yeah. revelation that the problem is, is way worse than they thought. What do you guys think about this issue? Well, normally I don't. Uh, Hickman stuff goes over my head, so I was really happy that I was able to understand what was happening in this issue and follow along. Uh, and also the repetitive nature helped, so I felt like that was uh, a good kind of kind of uh, marking place. I thought that was such a, you know, sometimes when you get a repeated. Um, a panel in a comic, you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I felt like it was done well in this. Yeah. So I was in, I'm impressed by it. Um, yeah. Um, it just, uh, you know, it got a little sad with that kid in the box. But other than that, it was uh, a really impressive, especially the art and the splash pages. Uh, there were some just epic splash pages in this. Uh, I also have been enjoying this. Like, it's got, it feels like almost a dare that Hickman was like, oh, yeah, uh, you want me to put some of these big nonsense in betweener characters into regular stuff? I'm on it. Uh, because he's finding a way to dance between the raindrops with them while setting up the these new, like, cosmic uh, poles in the, in the Marvel Universe with Doctor Strange sort of there being like, the the guy we know in the room while all these new characters are sort of handling most of the action um looking forward to the next issue uh i like the character that is the newbie coming into this world overall the series is very fun valerio shidi's art is fantastic great. all of the splash pages are great all of the weirdness with these giant cubes that the in-betweener has created are really interesting and very MC Escher inflected. My issue remains the same four issues into here. I keep saying the word issue this episode. Yes, I know. I know. I don't know why it's stuck in my There's head. There's other words. If you, there aren't. If you want to make a Doctor Strange series, just do a Doctor Strange series. I don't know what else this is bringing at this point in terms of the wind character, in terms of the, any of the other characters. It's like... <laughs> Doctor Strange is there, and like you said, there is a additional Doctor Strange. And yeah, but he's cooler. He's yeah, cooler but he's like guy. cooler, yeah. like a little funnier. So Doctor Strange has to be a little more serious by yeah, you know, by comparison. But it's just every single issue. I'm like, you could just have Doctor Strange, and it's okay. And this could be him palling around with Clea, and that would be fine. Like that's what is happening over in Jen McKay's Doctor Strange series. Yeah, and it's okay if you're going to have Jonathan Hickman on a book and he's going to be like, I'm going to totally remake this area of the Marvel Universe to then be like, this is kind of the same thing we could have had anyway. Uh, I don't know. That, <laughs> that's the thing that's holding me back. Well, that's what we said from the jump. It was like, oh, uh, I didn't think that's what this was going to be. But it's definitely what it is. And it's definitely it feels outside of the fact that it feels like in a book an image book that just happens to be in the marvel universe so doctor strange is also there and some of these other cosmic people it's like that's what it is so i feel like for whatever reason that's what it is yep there you go if you'd like to support this podcast and all the podcasts we do patreon.com slash comic book club also we do a live show every tuesday night at 7 p.m to facebook and youtube come hang out we would love to chat with you about comic books Excuse me. Yeah, Apple, on. Spotify, Android, or the app of your choice to subscribe, listen, and follow the show, but not Google Podcasts. No. Going away at the end of March. If you subscribe on Google Podcasts, please 
subscribe literally anywhere else. You can also transfer Google Podcasts over to YouTube Music very easily. At Comic Book Live on Twitter slash X Comic Book Club Live for uh, TikTok and Instagram, Comic Book Club Live.com for this podcast and many more. Until next time, Branton Stein is the doctor. No. <laughs> I got, gotcha, Pete. Pete, I'm sorry. You have to leave the room. <laughs> but don't worry. We'll get revenge on him. We'll age his children a little bit. <laughs> the ultimate revenge. <laughs> <laughs>